Reddick took the helm this week as struggling San Diego strives to build upon the hustle of Roberto Alomar and the hitting of Tony Gwynn. Led by swashbuckling all-stars such as Bobby Bonilla and Barry Bonds, the Pirates continue to treasure their perch atop the NLE. From its manager on down, Kansas City is experiencing a screaming, bat-breaking exercise in frustration as it languishes in the royal dungeon of the AL West. Meantime, up in Beantown, Ellis Burks and Dwight Evans have blasted the resurgent Red Sox into first place. We'll harken back to those golden days of yesteryear when baseball ruled radio's airwaves. And we'll relive a memorable week for a most unlikely all-star, Atlanta rookie Greg Olson. Major League Baseball is next on CBS Sports. I'm Andrea Joyce. Welcome to CBS Sports coverage of Major League Baseball. In case you may be wondering where Greg Gumbel is, well, he's alive and well and enjoying himself up at Fenway Park, where he'll team with Jim Cott to bring some of you the Royals and the Red Sox. Meantime, in Pittsburgh, Jack Buck and Tim McCarver are standing by, hoping that the weather is going to cooperate so they can bring the rest of you the Padres and the Pirates. And here in New York, George Steinbrenner continues to do what he does best, create headlines. According to a front-page report in today's New York Times, Steinbrenner, worried that he may be facing a lengthy suspension, the second of his career, is preparing to launch a legal attack on the commissioner's office. The court challenge would be mounted in the event the commissioner rules against the Yankee owner. It would center around allegations that baseball's investigation conducted for the commissioner by Washington attorney John Dowd was biased. Commissioner Faye Vincent yesterday defended Mr. Dowd and the investigation. George Steinbrenner has been unavailable for comment. Right now, let's quickly run down last night's West Coast scores, starting in Oakland, where the Milwaukee Brewers tagged Dave Stewart with his eighth loss of the year. Up at the Kingdome, Cleveland made it two in a row over Seattle, scoring 13 runs on Friday the 13th. And in Anaheim, Jim Abbott recorded his first shutout of the season. And we will be back with a nostalgic glimpse of the golden age of radio as we continue here on CBS. CBS Sports presents Major League Baseball. Today's pregame is brought to you by MCI, let us show you. And by AFTA, sensible care for sensitive skin. AFTA by Menon. Broadcasters, true confession. No matter how many cameras and videotape machines we use to cover a game, there are certain images best transmitted using only words to form the pictures. So we've asked Radio Hall of Famer Charles Osgood of CBS News to explain just why sometimes it's better to watch baseball on the radio. And here's the throw. Swings and a fly ball to deep right field. This is going to be a home run. Unbelievable. It was almost 70 years ago at Forbes Field in Pittsburgh that a man named Harold Arlen took his seat behind home plate. He was not just another spectator, though. He was the first person ever to broadcast a baseball game on radio. Nobody could have realized at the time that a great romance had begun or how much this medium molded of words and imagery would have to do with establishing baseball as the American pastime. The romance blossomed over the years, and baseball and radio went together like peanuts and Cracker Jack. It became as American as the game itself. There used to be an aura of mystery about, uh, about baseball, and because of radio, these were almost mythical characters. Radio made, uh, made baseball a family game. After radio was established, uh, the wife would often say, let's go to the ballpark, so the whole family would go. The women were shut out of the ballparks, practically, until radio taught them. Red taught me to take the blinders off, uh, not to concentrate on just baseball, because words were our tools, words were weapons, words were paintbrushes. It helped the individual uh, imagine the game and to color it with his own ideas his own experience, his own life, and his own desires. Uh, he became a participant. You didn't try to talk to that great group, but you always thought of one person. And if you succeeded in uh, describing the action, 
to that one person, and then you have succeeded describing the picture to 80 million people. Red and Mel were baseball radio pioneers, and their presence ruffled feathers with the older print media. You're not going to have any friends with the newspaper men. I said, why? He said, because you're going to make them go to work. Because you were giving out every detail, pitch by pitch. They can't just sit up and write now that uh, the Reds won uh, yesterday over the Phillies 2-1. Uh, to one. They're going to have to start writing. They're going to have to go to the clubhouse. They're going to have to interview ball players. <laughs> You're going to make them go to work, and they're not going to like you. Baseball with Dizzy Dean. When television established That's itself baseball, in the man, early 60s, the radio Yankee didn't move stadium. over. Instead, it taught game. TV a thing or two. And, uh, Art... No matter how hard they try on television, no matter how many cameras they have, they can usually only show you about one thing at a time. The radio broadcaster's telling you if the infield is in, he's telling you where the outfield is playing. To me, it's very much like uh, comparing radio and baseball and television and baseball to uh, reading a book and uh, seeing a movie. The ultimate compliment is for somebody to come up and say, uh, when I listen to you on the radio, uh, I feel like I can see it. I feel like I'm there. Play by play, I saw it on the ring. It is going. It is going. It is going. Speaking of Yankee broadcasters, Mel Allen and Red Barber were joined 34 years ago by Phil Rizzuto. And today, up in the Bronx, the Scooter is being honored at the Old Timers Day celebration for his 50 years in the Yankee family. Holy cow. We'll be back with more in a moment. Catcher for the Atlanta Braves started this season in the minor leagues, but a series of injuries led to his being called up to the parent club. Yet nobody could have ever imagined that last Sunday night he'd be heading to Chicago for the All-Star Game. I just can't wait to see all these heroes of mine, all-star heroes, in the same room, same clubhouse. That is going to be a fantasy. Olsen began living out that fantasy at the all-star workout on Monday where he mixed in distinguished company. And then on Tuesday night, he got his chance. Although there was no storybook ending to his Cinderella tale, Olsen will cherish the memories. And earlier today, I asked him about his fondest memory. Well, actually, meeting uh, the other Greg William Olsen was, was something I, I'd always wanted to do, especially after getting so many of his cards. So I had the chance to uh, finally meet uh, my brother. Greg, you, of course, are talking about the other Greg Olson, the Baltimore pitcher. You were both at the All-Star Game in Chicago. Was that a problem, as it's been all season, the confusion between you two? Well, actually, the, the only problem we had was the hotel operator. Every once in a while, we'd get some of his calls. He'd get some of, of our calls. Uh, actually, his sister-in-law called for, uh, Greg, for the other Greg's wife, and uh, my wife didn't know who it was and sat there and talked to her for five minutes before uh, they realized they wanted the other Greg Olson. And also, uh, the White Sox, Bobby Thigpen, called up. And uh, before I had a chance to say hello, he's, he was going, doogie, doogie. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, huh? And he goes, doogie. Wrong doogie. And, and he goes, oh, this must be the other Greg Olson. So we had some fun with it. You also had another event this week. Uh, for the first time in your career, you received a shipment of personalized bats, the bats with your <laughs> names on them. We've got one right here, but it seems like there's a problem. Are you aware of it? Yeah, as soon as, as, soon as they handed me the bats, uh, you know, usually the mis mistake they make is the double G on the end, but uh, this time they decided to put an E end on Olsen instead of an O end. Well, there's not a third Greg Olsen, is there? Uh, <laughs> not that I've heard of, but uh, you never know. Quite a year for Greg Olson. Right now, we're getting set for baseball. I'll be here throughout the afternoon to bring you scores, highlights, and news updates. CBS Sports coverage of Major League Baseball continues from the stadium after this word from your local station. We are dealing with some rainy weather here in the Pittsburgh area, but that doesn't stop these fans. The Pirates are way ahead in their attendance of a year ago, and the Pirate flag is flying high as CBS presents Major League Baseball.
Checking into town this weekend, the San Diego Padres, who lost here last night by the score of 4-1. to And because the Mets lost, the Pirates are now two games ahead of New York, with Montreal very much in the picture, only four games behind. Earlier this morning, Tim McCarver got together with Jim Leland, the Pirate manager. The Pirates have been in first place since April 21st, all but three days, and it seems, Jim, that the public perception is that the Pirates are chasing the Mets. Well, I don't think there's any question about that. I think going into the season, everybody felt that every team in our division was going to chase the Mets. Tim, they're a great ball club. There's no question. With the great pitching staff that they have, they can shut you out four or five days in a row. They can put streaks together like they just have, but fortunately, so far, we've been very consistent. We've held that off, and, and we've stayed right there with them, and They've won a lot of games the last month and a half, but we, we're still in first place. So I think the perception is probably right. I think everybody felt that way, and uh, we just have to play them tough, and we have to take care of our own business, not worry about the Mets right now. We just have to worry about the day-by-day -day competition. Speaking of your own business, what are your trouble spots throughout the rest of the season? Well, I think the biggest thing for us is to get consistency against left-handed pitching. You know, people try to neutralize us with that, and they do. It's no secret. I'm not telling anything out of school right here. We have to do a little bit better against left-handed pitching, and... Uh, probably get some pop from guys like King and Donnie Slot, get him back and healthy. And if we can do that, uh, we, we got a shot. The Pirates atop the National League East and the National League West. The Padres right in the middle. And their new manager is with Jack Buck right now. Jack? Thanks, Tim. And Greg, congratulations on your first big league managing job. Well, I think that's something that a lot of people get, like to get the opportunity to do. And I'm tickled to death with my chance. What do you hope to do with this club? Well, I'm hopefully stay positive with them right now. You know, we've gone through a lot of hard times, maybe not getting a combination of good pitching, uh, good hitting, good defense, and we're going to try to pull that together if we can. Maybe do some little extra work to try to help refine some of those areas and just stay as positive as we can and work through this thing, and uh, eventually we're going to have some fun. You're old for two. That's, I guess that's two mulligans, isn't it? Yeah, you're going to hook up with Bruce Hurst today, and today's the day. That's right. I use the mulligan on the front nine, the back nine, and I'm starting a new course. Greg Riddock has already stated he's not shooting for the pennant this year. This afternoon here in Pittsburgh, he'd be happy with his first victory as a major league manager. One over the Pirates today. Let's play baseball. CBS Sports presents Major League Baseball. Today's game is brought to you by Toyota's quality line of cars and trucks. Toyota, I love what you do for me. HBO, simply the best. And by new Bud Dry, cold filtered for smooth draft taste and dry brewed for no aftertaste. The first place Pirates take the field. And we have a nice gathering here on Saturday afternoon. Pittsburgh have already turned on the lights. And we might have a little rain before this day is over. Going to the mound for the Pirates. Just activated after being on the disabled list because of a groin injury is Bob Walk. He has a record of four and four to make room for him on the roster. They had to send out Jay Tibbs, and Tibbs has three days to determine whether or not he'll report to the Buffalo team. So they hope to get some innings out of Bob Walk this afternoon. Defensively for the Buckos of Pittsburgh, Barry Bonds. Barry talking hey, to first base on? umpire Harry Wendelstead. Barry tied an assist with Larry Walker of the Expos. And in center field, Andy Van Slyke, his second goal glove last year. Bobby Bonilla switched from third base. He made 33 errors at third last year. He's doing well in right field, thank you. Jeff King, the third baseman, the youngster out of Arkansas, the first-round draft choice in 86. Jay Bell, traded from Cleveland two years ago to the Pirates, has filled the bill at short. And combining with Chico Leaned, that's Gary Reedus, the first baseman, but Chico Lean is at second base. And Gary Reedus at first base. There's Chico. He's hard to find whenever you look for him. That's He's right. all over the field. He's too quick. <laughs> <laughs> Mike LaValue, who won a gold glove two years ago behind the plate. Unusual, starting against a left-handed pitcher today for only the second time this year. And there's Bob Walk on the mound. Here is the batting order for the San Diego Padres today. They have a couple of switch hitters in their lineup. They started with Bip Roberts. He's playing second. Tony Gwynn and right. Roberto Alomar is at shortstop today. He doesn't particularly like it there, but he's playing there. Joe Carter in the outfield along with Bill Stevenson at first base. Sean Abner plays center with Carter and left. Mike Pagliarulo at third base. Mark Parent is doing the catching. And the Pirates will have their hands full with the left-hander Bruce Hurst. Here is the manager of the Pirates, Jim Leland. 
quite loquacious and very happy about the way things are going for him and folks I want to tell you something we've seen the Pirates frequently this year and they are to be taken seriously the leadoff batter is a switch hitter Bip Roberts and he's hurting today he has a wisdom tooth that is really bothering him he's batting 284 and Bip has a little pop he can hit some home runs occasionally he has five for the year and he starts it with a base hit to left that was an easy swing and Barry Bonds gets it back in and we have some start one pitch one hit well, sometimes when you got a tooth that's bothering you it makes you keep your head in there and Pip Roberts keeping his head in there and lines one to left I'm saying that tongue in cheek Jack well, wisdom tooth in cheek mm -hmm. an easy swing and a base hit and now here comes one of the best hitters in the game up to the plate the left handed batter he's not a switch hitter Tony Gwynn four time batting champ he's only hitting 314 so he has yet to hit a stride walks pretty clever with his ability to keep runners close and Bip Roberts over first has stolen 22 bases being held by Gary Reedus. now the first one to Tony Gwynn runner going and a ground ball to lean runner at second base one out so they started the runner and that's something that Greg Riddock the new manager is trying to get done with these Padres two pitches and a runner at second base with one out it's unusual that on the first pitch even with a guy who handles the bat as well as Tony Gwynn that you hit and run I mean after all he hasn't seen Bob walk Tony grounding out to second base the right guy was covering Jay Bell the shortstop Here's Roberto Alomar all-star second baseman with a batting mark currently of 307 three home runs and back to second base is Bip Roberts Roberto Alomar he is playing shortstop today and he, he told us he doesn't particularly enjoy that position Tim he's played it only three times this year and as you might expect he's had problems with the throwing from the shortstop position over but low ball one from Bob Walk the plate umpire is Fred Brocklander the crew chief Harry Wendelstead is at first Joe West at second and Mark Hirschbeck a rookie umpire is umpiring at third after working the plate last night chance for the Padres to get out in front that's also low ball two. The third base coach is Sandy Alomar and his son is doing the hitting right now. So Sandy and Roberto and at the All Star Game Tuesday we saw the other Alomar Sandy Junior the catcher for Cleveland. Roberto could put the Padres on top and walk kept that ball away from him and got a strike and the new first base coach I'm very happy to be in the big leagues again is Rob Piccolo. He last played for the Oakland team. And he's been a roving instructor in the San Diego farm system and he'll get some more big league years. He has eight and a half and needs ten for the maximum pension years. Another one on the court. Good pitching by Walk. Runs the count to two two. Mike Levine the catcher. The runner is Bip Roberts. Shortstop trying to keep him close. And a breaking ball pops him up to the first baseman. That's Gary Ritas. Two out. He made three fine pitches after falling behind 2 0. Yeah, the fastball away on the 2 1 count, and then the good breaking ball. Left fielder, number 17, Joe Carter. Here's Joe Carter hitting in the fourth spot and look at that lowly batting mark but he's sixth in the league and runs batted in with 59. And this most happy fellow is waiting to hit his stride upon his return to the National League. Runner at second two out. Runner going low and away no throw stolen base they didn't even cover down there. Now that was because there were two outs if none are out or one out then most certainly Jeff King would have covered but Roberts just had too big a jump if you steal third from second 
with two outs, you better make it all the time. It's just not worth the risk if you're thrown out one time. Obviously, you can score from third easier from second, but it's just not worth the risk unless you're guaranteed that you can make it. 23 stolen bases for Bib Roberts. Ball one count to Joe Carter. That's off the plate inside, ball two. Oh, we got a break with the weather. We've had rain off and on all last night and all this morning here in Pittsburgh. Greg Riddock hoping he gets his first victory as a major league manager here this afternoon. Bruce Hurst is seated next to him. 2 and 0. Oh. He showed the button, took a strike. In the last 16 games, Joe Carter has only two runs batted in. Two and one the count and a half swing and a foul two and two RBI leaders in the National League Carter is fifth Matt Williams of the Giants first Barry Bonds of the Pittsburgh Pirates that's a career high for Bonds already with 66 and Clark teammate of Bonds Bobby Bonilla was 62 and Joe Carter fifth Carter's had a lot of opportunities you have to when you're hitting 220 with that many RBI he got him. A good sinker pitch, no runs, one hit and one left. So no score, first half inning. No score after one half inning. Bruce Hurst won 15 games last year for his new club, his second year with the Padres. He is five and seven. Here's the batting order for the Pittsburgh Pirates today. Gary Reedus will lead it off. And Jay Bell, Andy Van Slyke, Bobby Bonilla. Barry Bonds, Jeff King, Jose Lean, Mike LaVoyer, and Bob Watt. Defensively for the Padres, Joe Carter, he can play center or left field. Sean Abner, number one draft choice with the Mets back in 84. And Tony Gwynn does more than hit, his third gold glove last year. Mike Pallirulo over third base from the Yankees. Roberto Alomar, Jack mentioned playing shortstop his fourth game this year as Bip Roberts moves to second base. Phil Stevenson over from the Cubs last year at first base. Mark Parent behind the plate and Bruce Hurst on the mound. Benito Santiago out with a broken arm for the last month. Well, here's Gary Reedus. He's only batting 248. I heard his manager say this morning. He better start getting some hits or get on base. I'm not going to put him in there just because he's right handed. So Reedus has to earn a spot as a platoon first baseman. Sid Bream plays there most of the time. There at ball one. The umbrellas are up here by those who have brought them. And as I mentioned, we're going to have rain on and off all afternoon. It's a rainy weekend. More rain tomorrow forecast for Pittsburgh. Reedus takes it high, and that's ball two. Temperature 75 degrees. They set a lot of uh, record lows around the country last night, and aside from the rain, it's very pleasant over here. Hurst gets a strike in there. Hurst five and seven, and he has three complete games. Reedus much traveled. center and Tony Gwynn back at the track. That's the first out. This Pittsburgh manager Jim Lilly when he gets the leadoff man on base he didn't do it today. Likes to bunt with this fellow. Jay Bell. Bell batting 273 has solved a big, big problem for Pittsburgh. And they went through a host of shortstops. Finally, they acquired him from Cleveland. He's worked a lot with Tommy Sant to help his fielding. He's an ideal number two hitter. 23 sacrifices, leads the major leagues. And at 273 average, he's also got some pop. And a bouncer on one hop to Pagliarulo. Two out. A third base coach for Jim Leland is a fellow who hit a home run in his first major league at bat, Gene Lamont. And here's a fellow who's helped Jay Bell with his infielding, Tommy Sand. He said, the biggest thing I did with Bell was just to get him to calm down. He said, he can play as long as he just stays 
within himself nice and easy. Calm down and also he was playing on natural grass or grass over in Cleveland and there's a big adjustment when you come to the artificial surface. A lot of a lot more surface feels in the National League. They don't always start Andy Van Slyke against the lefty but they're doing it today. And there's a strike from Hurst. There's Jim Leland. He has things very well under control here. He has a good uh, staff of coaches. He has some good leaders on the club. And their team is getting healthier and healthier. By the way, they'll probably get Don Slot back tomorrow. He's their catcher, the right-handed hitter. He came over from the Yankees. So the Pirates, going well now, will be even stronger in the days ahead. And they added a pitcher back to their bullpen staff today. Like, oh, 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 oh. He let that ball play him, and on this wet turf, it ate him up a little bit. And Biff Roberts is charged with an error with two out. Uh, he did let it play him because he played this ball into an in-between hop. You can catch it on the big hop, or you can catch it on the short hop. The in-between hop, the turfest top to field, and an error on Biff Roberts. So when your wisdom tooth hurts, you don't think very well. And now Roberts is hoping that Hurst can get Bobby Bonilla. Switch hitting outfielder who has 19 home runs. He's fifth in the league. Fifth also in RBIs. Ball one low. This Bonilla is an exuberant player. He is happy to be out there. You see some guys walking around, their shoulders sagging, their chin on their chest. Never with him. He's Pleased to be where he is and be able to do what he can do. His second stint with the Pirates coming over from the White Sox for Jose De Leon. De Leon now with the Cardinals. Bobby Bonilla signed by Sid Thrift, the ex-general manager of the Pirates. That move by Hurst shows you how difficult it is to run on him. Van Slyke has nine stolen bases. 62 career pickoffs for Bruce Hurst. Only two this year, however. Well, they've gotten wise to him. Bonilla hits it on the ground to Pagliarulo. 5-4, and each team left a man in the opening inning. So we played one. Nothing doing. the second inning no score there's Sid Bream will tell you a story about him in a moment he's the regular pirate first baseman he was struck by a pitch ball here on Thursday night and they had a rumble it was right after Barry Bonds hit a home run in the first inning but we'll show you that story and I think you'll uh, be interested in watching the pitcher Andy Bennis and the pitch that struck Sid Bream meanwhile the batter here is Phil Stevenson who was brought up in the Cub organization He's hit four home runs. And he's playing first base today. Bob Walk the hurler and ball one. Tim, you know about this fellow's brother. You made me aware of his coaching. Gene Stevenson, the coach at Wichita State. Bouncing ball pitcher has to cover. Now the first baseman makes the play. Gene Stevenson's 14th year at Wichita State. When he went to Wichita State, they were uh, college champs a couple of years ago. But when Gene went over there, they didn't even have a baseball field. And now he has done such a terrific job financing the athletic department, certainly helping to finance the athletic department through their baseball program. Fine, fine program at Wichita State. Second hitter in the second inning against Bomb Walk is Sean Ebner. And they keep waiting for this fellow to blossom forth. He's hitting 239. Number one draft pick of the Mets a few years ago, up and down in the minor leagues. Takes care of himself defensively, but he hadn't been able to hit well. One ball, one strike. Speaking of first round draft choices of the Mets, Wally Backman, who's now a member of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Look at that. Boy, you talk about a run. The Mets have had it. That's how you build your organization. You get a Gooden, you get a Jeffries, you put them to work, you keep them in the lineup. That's that's how you build a winner. Eddie Williams, the 1983 first round draft choice, is also a member of the Padres. So three of those met first round draft choices here today. Abner hits one to Van Slyke. 
On last Thursday night, it occurred here, the home run by Bonds, and then the pitch by Andy Bennis. And he struck Bream on the right knee where he wears a brace. Ooh, that hurt. Hit him on the back of the knee. Joe West is the umpire. And that empties the benches. Watch it again. What do you think? This was after a three-run homer hit by Barry Bonds. The game won in 15 innings by the Pirates on Thursday night. Sid Bream is all right. It's only a bruise, but it was scary the other night. Because there for a while, Bream wasn't certain he'd play baseball again as a result of the uh, knee injury. But he did a lot of rehab, and he is available. Played here last night. Three knee injuries last year. Three knee operations, I beg your pardon. There's Mike Pagliarillo up there with two out. Our Padres have the Padres have the only hit. That was by Bip Roberts, but he was stranded in the first after stealing a base. And Pagliarillo, after a half dozen seasons with the Yankees, wearing the Padre uniform. And Walk pulled it. One and two. Bob Walk has retired five in a row. You talk about hanging in there. This fellow's been around the block with various clubs. He's persevered and has paid off. Now Yurulo spoils a good pitch, fouls it one and two. Bob Walks, first year in the major leagues, 1980. As a matter of fact, he was a rookie pitcher with the Philadelphia Phillies when the Phillies beat the Kansas City Royals in the 1980 series. Bob Walks started game one and won it. Another foul. So he, if the Pirates win it, he'll be one of the few with. World Series experience on the Pirate Club. Wally Backman and Andy Van Slyke, the only other two that have played in World Series. So only three of the 25 Pittsburgh Pirate players on their roster have World Series experience. They hope it's 25 next year. <laughs> now Yurulo with two out takes a pitch outside, two and two. You sit behind the uh, plate and you watch Bob Walk pitch and your eyes don't pop out. He doesn't throw extremely hard. The ball is not. He doesn't throw a big breaking ball, but you get up to the plate and he just won't groove the ball for you. It's always moving. And he pops him up. It's called for by Lean. This will be six in a row. We have played an inning and a half, and there's no score at Three River Stadium. McCarver and I both knew when we walked out to Wrigley Field last Tuesday night with the wind blowing in, there wouldn't be a lot of hitting. Yeah, I'll tell you, you know who was one of the more happy guys are probably the most happy guy to be there is Jim Leland his first all-star game showing us his all-star ring last night before the game and at the plate this fellow was a member of the all-star team and Bruce Hurst just missed with that one and his ball too there's the ring that they gave out to all of the all-star participants Tuesday night and Leland was very proud of it Hurst got the breaking ball in and it's two and one to Barry Bonds Look at those figures he's putting together. Foul ball, two and two. We mentioned his 66 RBIs, a career high. Primarily, that's because he had hit in the number one hole back in 1987 as a leadoff hitter. Primarily, he had driven in 59 runs. Boy, what production out of that number five hole this year? 66 RBIs, second in the league. 30 for 61 with runners in scoring position. High and away, three and two, and a good batting eye ordinarily. It's no secret that other clubs could have had Barry Bonds last year for in a trade, but Pirates are happy he's still here. He spoiled a tough pitch there, three and two. He's trying to catch Lenny Dykstra, then Sandberg, Dawson, McGee. We don't see Tony Gwynn's name there yet. Tony Gwynn is batting 314. He'll be up there before long and a leadoff walk from Hurst. You saw was number two behind Len Dykstra, two left-handers. I think the reason that Barry Bonds has a chance to, to, to go past Dykstra is Bonds hits left-handers better than Dykstra. Barry Bonds is batting 365 against left-handed pitching this year. That is remarkable. That's the best in the majors, left-handed batter against a left-handed pitcher. And he has stolen 24 bases. The batter is Jeff King. Pretty good hit and run man. Fly ball into the gap, and it's going to be caught by Carter. Runner gets back. Well, from a Pittsburgh viewpoint, that's too bad because Bonds had that base stolen. 
this pitcher Hurst does not get the left-handers out very well. No, as you can see, and we were talking about Barry Bonds, how well he handles left-handed pitchers. Well, Bar Bruce Hurst, as a left-handed pitcher, doesn't hand it, handle left-handed hitters well. He walked Bonds, but left-handers are batting 303 against Hurst, and right-handers only 229. That's remarkable. There's another good hit and run man, and a real hero these days. He's rapidly becoming the favorite of these Pirate fans, Jose Lean. Batting 305, and that combined with his defensive abilities, they tagged second. The umpire said no. That Bonds had not rounded the base and failed to touch it coming back. Lean is a tough out. He can go the other way with the ball, and he does most of the time. And every once in a while, he'll turn on the ball and try to crank it. He has no home runs this year. Inside. Hurst will pay a little more attention to Bonds now because Bonds got a very good jump when King was batting. Since Benito Santiago has been out of there, Padre catchers have really had problems throwing. They've caught only 20% or 20% have been caught since Santiago is out of there. Eight out of 41, but only three times has a catcher's throw been responsible for a caught stealing. So that, Another five pickoffs. That job belongs to Mark Parent, who's doing the catching today. One on, one out. That's on the inside corner, one and one. You can hear this umpire rather well. That's Fred Brocklander. I would imagine, too, that Padre pitchers get so used to having Santiago behind the plate with such a strong arm, they don't rely on their moves to first as well. That's why Hurst might have only two pick, two uh, pickoffs this year. Now it's two balls in the strike. And while talking about umpires, Fred Brocklander's wife Cheryl is. Now Harry Wendelstedt's wife is ill. Runner at first with one out and a foul ball out of play. Harry Wendelstead is the first base umpire and the crew chief. I was with him out in San Diego. He had spent the entire evening at the hospital uh, taking his wife there because of a bronchial condition. His wife's name is Cheryl. We hope she's doing well. He wanted to say hi to her down in Florida. Two and two to the batter. And a hit. And can't get that guy out. Bonds will go to third. I tell you, they love Jose Lind over here with all the stars they have. Lind is probably the most popular pirate of the moment. Well, you mentioned going to right field. The reason that he does that, he drags the bat head through the strike zone. This pitch is on the inside part of the plate. He, by dragging that bat head as opposed to popping the bat head, he's able to hit the ball the other way. With the bat at that angle, that's really the only way Lean can hit it. He tries to go the other way. That's his normal way of hitting. Well, let's see what comes of this. A leadoff walk. King lined out. Lean to first and third single, and Lavoyer fouls it back here. Strike one. This pirate batter is a good candidate for the double play if he will accommodate the infielders. He's only driven in 12 runs. There is a half a chance of a squeeze play. Lavoyer is a good punter. No score, second inning. First and third one out. And ball one to Spanky Lavalier. Third base, it is Barry Bonds. And across the way with average running speed is Jose Lean. could use the strikeout to pop up the double player or a pickoff. Hits are even at one apiece. Hard ground ball to one of the middle infielders for the double play. And that's high ball too. Now the squeeze really might be in order. With the pitcher on deck, one out, two and one the count. That negates the pitch out for the most part. Look at Mark Parent looking over to the bench to see if Greg Riddock wants to pitch out. 
And remember what we told you a while ago about left handed batters and how successful they have been against Hurst. Three and one. He walked the leadoff hitter in this inning. I wonder, I really wonder if he minds very much if he walks Lavalier. It's three and one. He yeah, he the does. Pitcher next. Pitcher next, and then Reedus. Yeah, but I mean, even a sacrifice fly, you hold a team to one run. You don't want a big inning, and by walking Lavalier, you take a chance of a big inning. First and third one out. Runner going. There's a strike, and they steal it unmolested. Now, I'm not taking up for Mark Parent, but Fred Brocklander behind home plate gave a late call. And one thing you want with a count three and one or three two, as a catcher, you want a quick call from the umpire. But Parent got a late call, and he hesitates. So it's second and third, and three and two on the batter. Now might first try to pitch around this batter. And it's going to be a run across. As Stevenson didn't want to take a chance. Unassisted put out by Stevenson. RBI for LeBayer is 13th of the year, and the Pirates break on top. The infielders were playing back, and they gave them the run on the ground ball, and Stevenson wouldn't take a chance, particularly with Bond's run. Right. And now the pitcher. Bob Walk, he has had three hits this year. It's not beyond him to get a hit. And a fly ball slicing foul and going out of play. With runners at second and third and one out, watch the break that Barry Bonds gets at third base on the high chopper hit by Lavalier. Going on contact, Bonds had that right foot planted. He got a good jump, and Stevenson saw that there was no play at home and correctly went to first base. Bob Walk's batting average during his major league career is under 200. He's batting 147. And this year, he's driven in one run. There's Bonds who crossed the plate for the first run here this afternoon. Two men out. Breaking ball and it missed. One and one. Well, the old leadoff walk in the inning. Leaned is the runner at third. Chopper foul puts the batter in the hole. Lead off walk and Pirates up one to nothing and Bob Walk hitting with two outs. I think if I were a pitcher and I had a name like Walk, I might change my name. Strike or out or something like that. I mean, Bob Walk is not a good name to have when you're a pitcher. One ball, two strikes, and he struck him out. The ball got away, and that's going to be another run for Pittsburgh. It's a strikeout and either a wild pitch or a pass ball. Well, maybe you could change it from walk to pass ball. A curveball. It almost looked like Mark Parent was crossed up. A curveball from Bruce Hurst and Parent going down on it, and it was in the dirt and squirts through. Parent didn't keep the trap door open or closed. I guess it's going to be a strikeout and a wild pitch by Bruce Hurst. Well, there's been a walk and a wild pitch and a stolen base in this inning, all of which add up to giving the Pirates a couple of runs. A strange thing. You see a ball club that's hot, as the Pirates are, two games out in front. Things of that sort happen for them. Pitcher up, runner at third, two out, wild pitch, another run. Gary Reedus is up. <laughs> Well, those are mound monikers. Bob Walk with the two-run lead now. Herb score, early win. What about Jake Stryker or Jack Armstrong? That'd be nice, too. <laughs> we might see uh, Jack Armstrong next week, next Saturday. One of our CBS games will be the Phillies playing at Cincinnati. Rita's flied out to start this game to right field. Walk is the runner, so they won't worry about him with two out. But the Pirates lead. 
Two runs and only one hit. That one's flying to the track, to the wall, and Carter can't get it. Walk will score. Carter is limping out there. It's three to nothing on the double by Reeders. This is a split finger fastball on the outside part. It was up, however. And Ritas, who is awfully strong, even though he has only one home run, can pump him out with regularity. And watch Carter mistime his jump. And it looked like he came down and hurt his left heel. It looked like his toe and heel hit the wall at the same time. Here's a better angle right here. It looked like his left toe slammed into the wall. The the outfield wall is padded, but about the bottom nine inches isn't padded. And Joe Carter, unfortunately, finds that part that isn't padded with his left foot. Right there. Slams into that concrete part of the wall that's about a foot from that padding. Yeah, he looked like he hit the inside of his ankle. Well, the trainer, Dick Dent, went out there, and Carter says he's going to hang in. But the Pirates have another run, and it's three to nothing, and they've made three runs and only two hits. A leadoff walk, a stolen base, a wild pitch after a strikeout. A nasty inning for the Padres. And at the plate, it's Jay Bell, who grounded a third his first time. Reedus with a double and an RBI. And strike one. When all is said and done, I bet if Joe Carter played that ball again, he would catch it, Tim. I, th I think he mistimed his jump. I think he thought the wall was there and that he had to get up. And that's one of the reasons he came down and crashed that left foot against the wall. This one's well hit by Bell. And this one is caught for the third out. Pittsburgh gets three runs on only two hits. They leave one, they've left two. And the Pirate fans like it. Joe Carter, there, there is that warning track, and you go from the artificial surface onto the warning track, and that's exactly what it means. It warns the outfielder that the fence is close by, but not that close, and that's why Joe Carter mistimed his jump. He jumped a little early, causing him to miss the catch and hit his foot. He appears to be all right, however. See, he just said he was all right. Shook his head, yes. All right, three to nothing, Pittsburgh. Third inning, a Mark Perrin to lead it off. These Padres certainly missed Benito Santiago, their all-star catcher, out with a broken arm. And ball one to Perrin. Inning 204, as you saw, with two home runs. The Pirates scored three times on two hits, plus a stolen base and a wild pitch. And a wild pitch to walk, a key pitch in that inning. There's a big breaking ball. Let's take another look at that wild pitch. This cost them two runs. The count one and two to Bob Walk. Two outs and a runner at third. Walk goes down on strikes, but the ball squirts through Parent's legs. And then Walk eventually scored on the double by Ritas, too. Here's a bouncer to third. And King throws. Let's go to New York and join Andrea Joyce for an update. Jack, here's one you don't see every day. Gerald Perry called for interference in the second inning, going out of the baseline to take Luis Rivera out of the play. Umpires say double play. Boston leads 1-0, bottom of the second on a Kevin Romine home run. Now let's go back to Jack Buck. Thank you, Andrea. Those, those umpires always get in a pickle when they call that play. Pitch is over but low to Hurst, who has had three base hits this year. Big enough to hit it, isn't he? 6'3, 217. Walks retired seven in a row. That's a foul ball, one and one. Bob Walk gave up a leadoff hit in the first inning to Bip Roberts. Roberts stole second, but was left down, and nothing since then for the Padres. There's a souvenir for a fan. Hurst gets a hit up the middle. That's the second of the day for the Padres. This San Diego team should be scoring runs, Tim, but they are not. Well, I think you hit it on the head. They miss 
Santiago. Santiago is off to his best year. Remember, he had the 33-game hitting streak as a rookie in 87. He fell off in 88. He came back with a good year last year. His defense is impeccable, probably the finest throwing arm I've ever seen. And you take a, a key guy like that out of the lineup and you take him off the field defensively, and problems occur. They have lost 12 out of 14 coming into today's game. Robert single to the opposite field his first time. He's a switch hitter. All on. And they don't expect the runner at first base, Bruce Hurst, to be doing anything. Rita's playing behind him. One on, one out. That's high. You heard the umpire say, and that's ball two. How about that? I didn't realize that. He loves that this is. turf. That means he chops down on the ball. Mm. There's ball three. Tough to pitch to also is the bipper. He's only 5'7". Member of the Pirates. As a matter of fact, he signed with the Pirates in the early 80s. He was drafted out of the Pirates system in 1985 by the Padres and has paid dividends. Bob walks. Uh, why did I do that? A base hit by the pitcher, a walk to the leadoff man so they can pitch to Tony Gwynn, who represents the tying run. The walk likes excitement, I guess. That's his first walk. Gwynn grounded to second his first time on a hit and run. Driven in 36 runs. By the way, Tony Gwynn has turned out a video with regard to hitting and also fielding and base running. If there's anybody qualified to talk about hitting, it is Tony Gwynn. There's a strike on the corner. Good he's, pitch from Walker. He's won four batting titles, and he says the thing that he is most proud of was his first gold glove. He really had to work at his fielding. He's worked at his hitting, too, but he had more talent as a hitter than as a fielder. He has three home runs. And his head came off the ball. One of the things about Gwynn is he usually keeps his head right on the ball on the pitch walk with a tailing fastball a curveball a slider and the split finger the pitch of the 80s that's gone into the 90s and an 0 2 count with two on one out third inning and Pittsburgh leading three nothing. Say one and two. This fellow is the most difficult to strike out in the major leagues. He just doesn't do it. Now he'll do it just to make us look bad. They give him the right field corner. Up the middle and off the pitcher and a force out for the second out. Well, that cost Glenn a hit. He reaches on the fielder's choice and the play went one four six. When this ball was hit initially I think Chico Lean is thinking double play. Well your priorities change once it hits walk. Now Bob slows it down a little so Lean is saying make sure one and he does it. And another little thing there at the tail end of the play you saw Jay Bell the shortstop get out of the way. You can't just stand there. I think that ball hit the bare hand of Bob Walk, and that's why he's pitching right now. His first pitch was high and wild, right off the DL. <laughs> his, his injury, which disabled him, was a groin injury. It had nothing to do with his arm. So Lavalier and Walk will talk it over. With the runners at first and third and two out. Here's a look one more time. That ball hit sharply back up the middle. And Bob going at it with sure. his bare hand, boy. I'll tell you, pitching coach Ray Miller had the gasp in horror when he saw Walt going at this ball with his bare hand. It's a competitive move. You don't think about it. You instinctively do it. It's the worst thing in the world that you can do. And now the man of the moment is Roberto Alomar. He popped to first his first time. First and third, two out. He needs that. All important two out hit. 
Mark's afraid that Gwynn might be stealing. Tony nursing that sprained left knee. He sprained the medial collateral in his left knee. Almost missed the All-Star game as a result. So he might not be doing much running, nor will Hurst, who's over at third base. And ball one. And there's Bruce Hurst over at third with two out. And across the way, Tony Gwynn. They have to hold against them, so Alomar might be eyeballing that space down there and trying to pull the ball. Alomar has hit three home runs. Three to nothing. The Pirates lead here in the third. Hit by the pitcher and a walk has opened the door. Good strike from walk, one and one. Walk takes his sweet time when he pitches out there. He's about as slow as there is in the National League. High and away. That's ball two. There's Greg Riddock. He needs some runs. He got only one here last night. What did he tell you before the game? It used up his mulligans, huh? <laughs> he wants something from Alomar. The hits are even at two apiece, but Pittsburgh has all the runs. Alomar finds a hole and drives in a run with a two out hit. Hurst crosses the plate. He had singled with one out. And it's three to one. Win stopped at second. And the Padres have a chance to get more. Good hitting by Alomar. Even though the hole was available on the right side, the pitch is on the outside. If you try to pull this pitch, you'll play pepper with the second baseman. Alomar uses all parts of the field in which to hit, and he pops one into left field. And I would imagine Jim Leland is worried about Bob Walk's pitching hand. And one of the coaches said to Leland today, well, let's get four innings out of him. And Leland said, four innings? He wants, I want more than that. And they said he hasn't pitched in a month. He said he's been throwing every day. Why do we activate him if he's not ready? Some fun next on the golf course here on CBS. The Reebok Norman Challenge. Greg Norman takes on Wayne Gretzky, Larry Bird, Yvonne Lindell. First of a two part golf presentation from the Champions Golf and Country Club in Rogers, Arkansas. It's taped. The players are miked, and there will be a lot of fun. As you hear all the kibitzing that will go on, you'll see the front nine play today and then tomorrow the back nine. Meanwhile, Joe Carter is up, two on, two out. Tying runs on base for the Padres. And they need a blast. Carter struck out his first time. Ball one. Carter has 13 home runs. He'd like to get up to those figures he compiled with Cleveland last year 35 home runs. Breaking ball over, but low. At second base, it is Tony Gwynn. And at first, Alomar. So good speed on the bases and Joe Carter at the ditch. Three to one the Pirates lead now in the third. See you later huh. Down the line and a long home run way back and suddenly suddenly the Padres take the lead for three. As Bob Walk gives up his 11th home run of the year. Number 14 on the season for Joe Carter. Wasn't any doubt on that one. And a happy Greg Riddock. All of this with two out. And there Leland. Trying to get Bob Walk back in the rotation. They give him a three run lead and he blows it here in the third. A happy Padre bench. the banner with two out is Phil Stevenson. There's the strike. Well the count had something to do with this. Walk had missed with with two breaking balls and then he threw the fastball to Joe Carter and Joe was looking for it. 
I said that earlier about walk. He doesn't blow people away with that fastball. And if he makes a mistake with it, why? That's why they've hit 11 home runs against him. Well, the mistake was falling behind. See, the mistake often is not the pitch. It's how you got there. You miss with two breaking balls, and now you get the fastball, and it's like batting practice. If you get it, guys like this, they don't pop it up or foul it back. They hit it hard, and Joe did. That's why they give Carter and people like that all the money. <laughs> if the hitter guesses right with the talent of Joe Carter, they can do some damage, and he just did damage to Bob Walk. Four runs on three hits and a walk. Stevenson in the hole, and he took the pitch two and two. A struggling start for the Pirate right-hander Bob Walk. Came into this game with a record of four and four. Three and two. Well, for a lot of reasons, it doesn't appear he'll be a winner today. Doesn't look like he'll pitch those five innings, and the hand might be bothering him. Though. On three and two, a foul ball. Yeah, you know, it's a hard thing. We saw Jim Leland go out and, and talk to Walk. The pitchers want to pitch. I mean, they're competitors. And you Jim Leland knows that. I mean, you, you want them to tell you the truth. You want them to, but they're competitors. I mean, you can understand Bob Walk's been out for a month. He wants to go at least five innings. There's a bouncer with a pitcher covering. It is four runs. On three hits and a walk. We go to the home half of the third inning, 4 3 in favor of San Diego. We'll return to Three River Stadium after this message and a word from your local station. Kurt Simmons, the left handed pitcher who kept everything simple, used to say when the big guys hit him, there's no doubt about it. Carter knew it, Jeff King knew it. And look in center field. Barry Bonds knew it. Good night. Three run homer. And this is why they just took one step. I mean, that ball was corked. Woo. Now it's Andy Van Slyke leading it off. He reached on an error his first time. Nothing came of that. So he's 0 for 1. And hitting in the number three spot for Pittsburgh. Pirates leading a trailing 4 to 3 now after. Blowing their 3 0 lead. Here is Bruce Hurst having difficulty again pitching to the left hand. He walked Bonds to start the second. And the ball in on him. Two balls and a strike. It's the heart of the order for the Pirates. Van Slank, Bonilla, and Bonds here in the third. Slight's a real character. Let's see what Bruce Hurst does now that his mates have gained the lead for him. He gave up a walk and delivered a wild pitch in the second inning. And Slight with a late swing and a pop fly to Carter. One out. Hit that ball with one hand. And flies out to start the bottom of the third. That fellow's always smiling. He is a happy, happy person. Yeah, he and, he and Bobby Bonilla have the same temperament. You, mentioned, you mentioned Bonilla uh, earlier. They're always smiling. They really have fun playing the game. And here's the other smiler, Bonilla. Ball one. Not only has Greg Riddock not won in the big leagues as a manager, he hasn't even been ahead until today. As he is 4-3 here in the third. Ball high, ball two. Bonilla with 19 home runs. Out of play. Two balls and a strike. He's a switch hitter. You know what I saw him do here a couple of weeks ago? Turn around and bat left-handed against John Tudor, a left-handed pitcher, and hit a home run. He gets a hit here. Yeah, I remember that he had gone so poorly against Tudor, he figured, why not? I'll bat left-handed. 
as a right-handed batter this year, he's hitting only 223, almost 100 points higher left-handed. But he hits one off the end of the bat off Bruce Hurst. Has a base knock. And yeah, that didn't sound too good, did it? No. But it looked good and dropped in for the third Pittsburgh hit. You'll trade a bat for a hit any day. Mm -hmm. Here is Bonds. Walked and scored in the second. Look what a short lead Boney is taking against this left-hander. He's taking no chances. You're not going to pick me off today and embarrass me. He could fall down and get back. Ball outside. Ball two. If he fell down, he'd be he'd be in the coach's box. <laughs> Don't go too far, Bobby. Yeah, well, sometimes if a left-hander's got a good move, you just resort to your softball rules. You stay on the bag. And there's ball three. So Hurst heads for trouble again. Barry Bonds sporting an earring. Saw his father at the All-Star game. Played in the old timers game, Bobby Bonds. There's ball four. That's the second time Bonds has walked. Well, that's what happened when he hit 16 home runs, drive in 66, and bat 339. So Hurst, who has trouble getting left handers out, is going to take his chances two on, one out, with the right handed hitter, the Pirate third baseman, Jeff King. platooned at third base with Wally Backman. I think they'd like to improve that position a little bit with Pittsburgh, don't you, Tim? Get a little more production mm -hmm. out of it. Mm -hmm. King has hit three home runs. Quite a college player in Arkansas. Jeff King. Saw this batter, King, go the other way last night and get a base hit. Two on and one out. Double play ball. Alomar to Robertson. The inning is over. No runs, one hit, a double play, one left. Pittsburgh has left three. They trail by a run. One thing about the Pirates, they are not hearing footsteps from the Mets. The Mets have played as well as they can play. Behind Daryl Strawberry, who has 15 home runs in his last 29 games, and one of the bigger surprises in the National League East, Dave Schmidt, 12 saves and two wins in his last 16 games for Montreal. And ball one to Sean Abner leading off in the fourth inning with the Padres on top, 4 3. You happen to see a fellow like Dave Schmidt come along and find success. It's not unusual for pitchers who've been around for a while to suddenly become effective. Third baseman had just backed up, but he still couldn't get it. Abner got one through on this wet, fast turf here at Three River Stadium. I bet that third baseman thought he was going to field that ball. A lot of people say the ball picks up speed. I know what it does do. It has that overspin, and that accelerates through the infield, and your point's well taken. You can almost see the way King went after that ball, that he thought he had it, but that ball scooted through for a hit. Got to be quick on this turf, and it's wet on the infield and in the outfield. Up now is Mike Pagliarulo. He popped out his first time. Abner is running, swinging a miss, and a good throw by the ball. Stuff to steal against this pirate catcher. It's also tough to steal against Bob Walk. With Walk pitching, a lot of people complain about him throwing over there too much. This is a hit and run play. Abner does not have a good jump, but with Bob Walk pitching, the opposing runners have only stolen four bases in 12 tries. Good throw by Lavalier. And a good tag by Bell. Got right to the base. You see some infielders take that throw in front of the base and make it difficult for themselves, but Bell did not. Urillo uh, takes the ball one and one. Yeah, if the ball is tailing into the runner, you can understand a shortstop or a second baseman taking the throw out in front of the bag. But if the throw's on line and that that can be determined easily, then you ought to stay on the bag to make the tag. Now uh, Urillo is in the hole. Hey, 
So the leadoff man is gone. Two lefties warming up. Ruskin for this game. And Kipper. One of the shortstop Bell and two out. And then John Smiley was up and warming up. This fire bullpen has done the job on the far side is Kipper. The lefty closest to you is Smiley, one of the starters. He's not getting ready for this one. Well, the Bucks bullpen, they have done such a terrific job this year. In their last 43 innings, they have allowed one earned run. So what was a weak point last year, the Pirates bullpen last year, 19 and 25, an earned run average of over three and a half, or right around three and a half. And this year, they have really turned it around, turned it around bullpen by committee. And this fellow has done a good job of managing this team and that bullpen, Jim Lillard. He's trailing in this one, though. 4 3 is Mark Parent bats. He grounded the third his first time. Two out, nobody on. That's low. 3 0. Oh. We're at Three River Stadium at Pittsburgh. The sky is at brightened considerably. Pittsburgh got three in the second, but the Padres have come back with four. Three of them on a home run by Joe Carter, and they lead 4 3. Walk throws a strike and didn't let up to throw it in there. 3 and 1. Is one to short to Jay Bell. No runs, one hit, the man out stealing, nobody left. Home half of the fourth inning coming up. Padres lead 4 3. <laughs> Joe Carter ran to the wall, stayed in the game, hit a home run. What does he think about money and renegotiating? Yeah, along, along the lines of my talent coming along and signing for eight. You know, more power to him, but I'm going to have to work out what I sign because I've got to live up to that and honor the contract that I signed. Uh, you don't see ball players going in and have a bad year saying I want to renegotiate because I'm overpaid. No, I guess we've never heard of that. <laughs> Boy, is that a refreshing thought in this day and age. Here's ball one to Jose Lean. We're underway in the bottom of the fourth. I've never heard of a ball player going in and giving money back. Or announcers either. <laughs> 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 There's a strike called the lean. He singled his first time, stole a base, scored a run, and set up a three run inning for Pittsburgh. He bounces one to Pagliarulo. And the leadoff man is gone. We showed you the Pirate bullpen earlier. There was activity out there, but not now, so they're going to go further with Bob Walk, who will follow Mike Lavalier to the plate. Navarre's infield out drove it a run in the second inning. He's been toying with the idea of switch inning, and we've seen him bat right-handed, and he's rather effective. Hurst got the breaking pitch over. I'll tell you, Lavalier helps the Pirates in so many ways. The fine throw in the top half of the inning. Coming over from the Cardinals with Andy Van Slyke. Whitey Herzog calls it the worst trade and that he has ever made. And on that short hop play, hey, we missed that first time around. That was a terrific backhanded play of the short hop and a strong throw to second base. Fine play by LaValliere. You don't run willy-nilly against him. He got down there in less than five seconds. I had a watch on him. And he gets one of his rare infield hits. So Levier gets a hit. Fourth of the day for Pittsburgh. Biff Roberts did all he could. Roberto Alomar crossing in front of Roberts. When you do that, if you're the infielder, you don't want to stop because you get in the way of the fielder fielding the ball. So Alomar continues. Roberts does all he can, but Levier. 
being swift to foot. Sped across the base. An infield hit, of course. <laughs> and that gives the pitcher a chance to bunt. One on, one out. Foul ball. How about that? He's not bunting. That surprised me. Sometimes walk, and I've seen him do it frequently, will show the bunt and then swing the bat. The Red Sox out in front. They're tied with Toronto. Kevin Romine a home run. Roger Clemens trying to win game number 13. Clemens and Boddicker both having great years for the Red Sox. Tough to pick Lavalier off also. Pittsburgh has stolen 71 bases this year. Lavalier none of them. Strike two. I don't know what the reason is why they're not bunting. Maybe they figured it'd take too good a bunt to get Lavalier down to second. Well, that, I'm certain that, yeah. that that enters the thinking. That might be a reason that Phil Stevenson is holding Spanky on at first base. Instead, he prefers to hit into a double play, and the inning is over. No runs and one hit, nobody left. We played four, four, three, Padres. Presents Major League Baseball. Today's game is brought to you by Toyota's quality line of cars and trucks. Toyota, I love what you do for me. Newprint, the medicine that gives you big pain relief in a little yellow pill in tablets and caplets. And by Diet Pepsi, the right one. We're into the fifth inning here at Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh, and a four run third has the Padres on top. The error by San Diego didn't figure into the scoring, and the pitcher will lead it off. He got a base hit in the third. Bruce Hurst's fourth hit of the year, and that started the rally with a one out base hit, and the Padres took it from there. His single went up the middle against this pitcher, Bob Walk. And he hits it to short to Jay Bell. Well, if you've just joined us and want to know what has transpired to this point, the Pirates got three runs in the second, and Gary Ritas had an RBI double, and that capped things off in that inning, and there was a wild pitch that cost the Padres a run, but then with two out, Joe Carter hit a home run in the third inning, and it has given the Padres the lead. Funny you mentioned Bruce Hurst and how he figured in the scoring with that one out hit to score a run. Bob Walk has also finished figured in the scoring. He was a strikeout victim with a runner at third and two outs. Wild pitch, the runner scored Chico Lean, and then Walk scored on Reedus's double. So both pitchers have figured in the scoring. Bib Roberts has a single and a walk, and he shows a bunt and takes a ball. We're in the fifth inning, and the leadoff man has been retired. Pittsburgh has really had the number of these Padres. After winning only three against San Diego last year, the Pirates have won nine out of ten from San Diego. That's out of play, including five out of six in the Padres' home park. These Pirates are terrific at home. Best home record in baseball, 25 and 10 here in, at Three Rivers. Robert showed a bunt again. Ball two, two and one. There's Jim Leland. going to happen this season. There's a bouncer to lean. To. Tim, I see a lot of infielders such as lean just then do what Manny Trio used to do. I think he was the first one who slowed things down at second base when he knew he had a lot of time. Took that little pause, a little pump. Trio did it very well. The most errorless games, 89 before it was broken by Ryan Sandberg this year. I tell you that nationally gifted with great second baseman now. Lean with ter terrific range. Alomar, who's at shortstop today, great range. Sandberg. Robbie Thompson, only three errors this year. Well, we welcome those folks who are watching Kansas City at Boston. We're at Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh. There's nothing going on at the moment. 
We lost uh, the transmission of our picture from Fenway Park, so we'll get that fixed up. Meanwhile, enjoy this game. It's the Pirates and the Padres. Two out, fifth inning. San Diego leading 4 3. Bob Walk pitching to Tony Gwynn. Gwynn is 0 for 2, and he has a count of 1 and 2 after that foul ball. Pittsburgh got out in front in this game with three runs in the second inning with a walk a wild pitch and a stolen base figuring in Tony Gwynn's going to be 0 for 3 that's unusual three ground balls against Bob Walk we're going into the bottom of the fifth inning and behind Bruce Hurst the Padres lead it 4 3 at three river stadium San Diego leads by the score of four to three we had a transformer go out in Boston and for those of you who are watching the Kansas City game we're trying to get that game back for you here's the big blow the big question is do you think he knew it was a home run <laughs> <laughs> two on two out when Joe Carter connected and changed changed the score here to find the Padres on top and Gary Reedus who's batting in the number one spot will lead it off against the left hander Bruce Hurst. Harris with a record of five and seven got the breaking ball in. We're going to keep you informed of what's transpiring Kansas City at Boston and we'll try to get you back there if we can take care of the technical problem the electrical problem. Meanwhile the top of the pirate order here in the fifth. Reed is not hitting much on the air He's filling in at first base for Sid Bream who usually plays there. First I'd like to improve his record he's five and seven after winning 15 last year and speaking of Boston Hurst wore that Red Sox uniform for so many years and really changed their club when he left as a free agent number one draft choice by the Red Sox in 1976 and his second full year with the San Diego Padres he was 15 and 11 last year he got that pitch in there to even it up two and two you might wonder why the Red Sox let him go. There was a lot of a lot of talk up in New England. I mean, here's a guy from 1986 to 1988 was 33 and 9 at Fenway Park. 33 and 9 with the Green Monster. A lot of right-handed hitters facing him. Out of play by Reedus. Two and two to the leadoff batter. of the fifth. First missed the inside edge three and two. Of course as far as free agency is concerned you don't know what kind of offers are out there. Daryl Strawberry we saw earlier the around the horn from our understanding the Mets have cut off talks with Daryl and his agent. There's a big gulf between them as far as money is concerned and they'll negotiate at the end of the season. There's a lead off walk. That's the second time Hurst has done that today. Walk to the leadoff hitter. Sports Sunday on CBS tomorrow will feature, among other things, a show called Let Me Be Free. It's a special climb of Mount Kilimanjaro, which is the tallest mountain in Africa. It's in Tanzania, in fact, 19,342 feet. Better these people than me trying to climb that mountain. It's a group of Californians who are mentally disabled but physically capable and that's a thrilling show tomorrow mm -hmm. on Sports Sunday and you'll join James Brown on CBS tomorrow afternoon at 2 Eastern time. A leadoff walk. Let's see if Bell bunts. It is a foul ball. It's not unusual for him to be bunting. We mentioned it early 23 sacrifices that leads the major leagues. You're interested in the National League record. Kid Gleason did it back in 1905. He was a fighter, wasn't he? Uh, you know, he was eventually the manager of the of the 1919 White Sox. He had 43 sacrifices that year, and he was not suspended after that season. But eight other players were banned from baseball by Judge Landis. The Red Sox are leading one to nothing in the fourth, and the home run by Kevin Romine over the Royals. One of the reasons they bunt so frequently with this batter Jay Bell is that he hits into a lot of double plays. So with a potential tying run at first and Rita's by the way can steal a base he swiped five. 
Pittsburgh was playing the bunting game. And as Hurts threw over there, Rita showed the bunt again. This batter is grounded into six double plays this year. Padres by a run, bottom of the fifth. Hurst very adept at picking runners off. I would suspect Bell will be bunting again to give you an idea of how many bunts that is, how many sacrifices. The second batter is Mike Bilecki, and he's a pitcher with the Cubs. There goes the runner. And a fly ball into right for Tony Gwynn into the corner. Runner will get back with one out. The bell tried, but couldn't advance the runner. One on, one out. And Reader's got a good jump, by the way. The bell is hot. Center fielder, Andy Van Slyke. Hotter than a taco. Taco Bell. Here's Andy Van Slyke. He's 0 for 2. One of the reasons Van Slyke is in the lineup against the lefty, and we'll repeat this for those who've been with us, but those who are watching the Kansas City-Boston game, Hurst has trouble getting left-handed batters out. Coming into this game, left-handed batters had batted 303 against Bruce Hurst. That is really unusual. And right-handers batting 229. That's why Vance likes playing today. That's on the corner. Strike one. Tell you the one thing you have to do if you're a left-handed batter and you're facing a left-handed pitcher more than at any other time, you've got to keep your front shoulder in there. If you give at all with that front shoulder, you are dead against the left hand. Good runner. Redis at first draws the throw. Pretty close as Hurst stepped off. 4-3. The Padres leading here in the fifth. They about hit Pittsburgh 5-4. Now, for those of you who joined us briefly, back to the Kansas City-Boston game. Hope you enjoy the remainder of the afternoon. Dan Slyke, the batter. He's in the hole. First paying a lot of attention to Reedus. When Reedus first broke in with Cincinnati. Looked like he was going to be an everyday ball player for the Reds and be one of the most prolific base stealers in the league. And he didn't hit well enough to stay in the lineup. He went over to the American League and he's back here. One on, one out. There he goes. He got a running start, but a fly ball in the center. Should be handled by Abner. And the runner back to first with two out. Well, that's a bad break for Pittsburgh and Reedus because he really timed Bruce Hurst and got a running start away from first, but Van Slyke is 0 for 3. That's for the second time. If you remember, Reedus was running when Bell hit the ball to Gwen in right field. He had a good jump then. He had a good jump when Van Slyke hit the ball to center field. Pittsburgh's not out of the inning yet with Bobby Bonilla up there. He has a single one for two. And he has hit 19 home runs. Switch hitter. Well, that's nice when you have a switch hitting number four hitter. You don't have to worry about that lineup every day. Ball one. Bonilla hit into a force out by way of third and then Plunked a single in the right center. He was trying to go to right field. Now, so I think sometimes a pitcher makes you do that by the location of the pitch. Bobby Bonilla can crunch. That ball was tailing away, the fastball tailing away, and sometimes that's the only thing you can do is go the other way. We just said first two out. Their baseman very deep. That one sunk low and away, two and one. So you can't do any more as a hitter than the pitcher's pitch allows you to do. If the pitch is away and you try to pull it, you're doing exactly what the pitcher wants you to do. The lead off walk in the inning. Now there are two out. And the count goes to three and one. Well, what do you do? Danger time. That's yes. when that yellow light floats up in the strike zone. Danger. Be cautious. 
Runner at first, two out, three and one. And a high fly ball at the track and center for Abner. Will end the inning. No runs, a walk, one left. Pittsburgh has left four, and they still trail by a run, four, three after five. In case you thought we were smart, Tim McCarver and I, we're not. <laughs> this man is smart. Steve Hurt with the Elias Sports Bureau. He's the man who handles all the statistics for us. And it's kind of interesting that uh, this year the Pirates are 16 and 9 in one-run ball games, but not so last year. They were 19 and 32. And what's the connection, Steve? Well, when you do poorly in one-run games, nobody likes to do that. But I guess if that's a cloud, there's a silver lining to it. First pitch, a swing and a miss by Roberto Alomar here in the sixth. And the uh, silver lining is simply that if you do poorly in one run games in a given season, generally you bounce back to do very well overall the next year. One and one to Alomar. For example, the Pirates last year, 74 and 88 overall, 13 games below 500 in one run games. Alomar leading off in the sixth. And that ball stays fair and Walk throws him out. And what that 13 games under 500 uh, foreshadowed was the turnaround of the team this year. Because generally, teams that do poorly in one run games in a given season turn around and are uh, poised for a turnaround, if you will, the following year. If you look back at uh, baseball history, you see that in the 60s, the Twins did poorly in one run games in 64, won the pennant in 65. Same with the Red Sox and the Mets before their miracle years. And the batter now is Joe Carter, who has delivered the biggest blow of this game to this point, a three-run homer, with two out in the third inning. So the, there's even more past history. The 60s and now the 80s, we too, We looked right? at the 60s, and in the 80s, if you think of the three teams in recent times that have turned it around quickly, the Twins when they won the title, the Dodgers and the Orioles, all of them came from poor years in one-run games the year before. Well, who's to say it's not more than coincidence? I'll be the uh, devil here, and the devil's right. advocate. Oh, sure. Well, what we've done is we've looked at not just these six teams. We've, we've, we've picked off the highlights for display here, but we've looked at all teams generally in baseball history, and it makes sense when you think about it. Carter chops one to short to Bell. Two out. It makes sense in, the, in that teams that lose games by one run generally are not that far away. You don't, you don't lose a blowout game by luck, but you can often lose a one-run game by luck, and luck has a way of evening out. And usually, Steve, if you lose a lot of one-run games, you do something about it. You might play differently. You might sacrifice differently, or you might use a different uh, uh, group of pitchers out of the bullpen. Or bolster uh, your bullpen with an extra guy who may make the difference. Is it, that right? It could even be due to a key injury. One guy who's missing, he's back the next year, and he makes the difference. So for that reason, if you do poorly in one-run games in a given season, all is not lost. Just hang in there, and maybe next year it'll be your year. Okay, folks, if your ball club is dropping games by one run, Take heart. Wait till next year. Bill Stevenson, a one ball, one strike count with two out. And the score, 4-3 Padres leading in the sixth. Bob Walk just off the disabled list. Pitching well at this moment. Falls behind the batter, two and one. He's retired seven in a row. Walk did that earlier, but then a hit by the pitcher. First. A walk to Bip Roberts, a two out RBI single by Alomar, and the home run by Carter. Now a strike. You don't see Lavalier drop many pitches like that. Now the Pirate bullpen, they're sitting around. On the closest to you is Stan Belinda, number 50. Who does he remind you of from television days gone by? Oh, Ronnie Howard. Are you kidding? And look what he's doing flipping sunflower seeds. <laughs> There is a shot for the third baseman King. That's eight in a row retired by Bob Ward. Well, the Pirates still are only a run behind as we go into the bottom of the sixth inning. We'll return to Three Rivers Stadium after this message and a word from your local station. Oh, where Opie is, Aunt B can't be far, far from, far away, can she? There it is, Ronnie Howard and Stan Belinda. Looks just like Opie. Here, Barry Bonds hitting one. That's going to tie the game. Four, four in 
the sixth, the 13th home run hit against Bruce Hurst this year. Well, I guess you could segue from Opie to oops. That's probably what Bruce Hurst was thinking when he threw this down and in fastball to Barry Bonds. What a year Barry Bonds is having. He had walked twice today, and then Bruce Hurst came after him, and he got burned. Remember, batting 365 against left-handers coming into today's game. Here's one that's going to be handled by Carter for the first out. Bonds doesn't particularly care who the pitcher is. This is his ninth home run this year against left-handed pitching and his 17th overall. More against lefties than right-handers. And Jeff King lined out to left for the first out. There's our line score here in the sixth. We've got some action at Three Rivers. The batter is Jose Lind, ball one. Lind is from Puerto Rico. I foul ball, and it's going to go out of play. Back a couple of rows. We talked about Andy Van Slyke and how he approaches left-handers and trying to keep his shoulder in there, and that's what left-handed hitters do against left-handed pitchers. Well, Jose Chico Lind does that also. He tries to hit the ball up the middle and the other way. That's when his average is high, batting 306. And one ball, two strikes with one out. The only time Lind will pull the ball is if it's a breaking ball. He has grounded to third once today. But he also got that key hit to right center in the second inning and scored a run. A run home on the Bonds homer. We're tied 4-4. Lean with one out in the hole one and two. And see with two strikes, he's even more pronounced trying to keep the shoulder in there. So if you're Bruce Hurst, the best time to pop him inside is with two strikes. He tried to get him there, but Lean fought it off. For the shortstop, a diving try by Alomar and safe at first. That's the second hit for Lind. Oh, what a play by Alomar. Only his fourth game at shortstop this year. He did play 113 games in 1987. Well, what range Alomar has. That's why he can go from second to third base. He may not have the arm for it, but he certainly has the range for it. So now the Pirates have the lead run on. And Lavaier the batter. Lavaier gets a hit. That'll make it first and third with one on. pinch hit for Bob Walk. Well, this is about all the innings. They wanted out of Walk anyhow. Now Walk could he can't lose and he could be the winner. Walk pitched six innings. Four runs and five hits. Walk one fan one. It is a wet turf. It appears that Lind was limping going around second base. And now something's wrong with his left leg. And Jim Leland is now out talking to Lind and probably saying, Chico, if you're hurt now, tell me because you represent the go-ahead run. Either that or he's saying, can you pitch? <laughs> <laughs> Here it is one more time. Remember, the, the turf is wet right there is where it appears that Lind going into third base had hurt that left leg. Chico appears to be all right. I'll tell you, on the artificial surface, a lot of things bother you that wouldn't ordinarily bother you. Your knees, your ankles. The reason for that, when the feet hit the turf, there's no resilience. He appears to be all right. When you think about it, he may have hurt it reaching for the bag on the fine play by Alomar. A lot of times when 
base runners try to beat out an infield hit. They jam that left heel, as was the case, we think, with Lean there. So he may have jammed that left heel into the bag. Jose appears to be all right, however. But Joe Carter is not all right. He is limping off the field. And Thomas Howard, a rookie, Middletown, Ohio, just up from Las Vegas, the AAA Farm Club for the Padres, takes over and left. You remember Joe Carter ran into the fence earlier in this game, but he has to leave now. And he had a three-run homer while he was in there. And the pinch hitter is Orlando Merced. It was four out of 11. Just up from Buffalo. And he's batting for the pitcher walk. First and third. Hurst stays in there. Four for the score. And a chopper foul. Strike one. The new Pittsburgh hurler is going to be Ted Power. He's just off the disabled list today at the expense of Walt Terrell. So Terrell's been given the option of reporting to Buffalo or he'll be released. I say it's a gutsy move by the Pirates because what it means if Terrell elects to to go to free agency again is they've got to eat a three year contract. Over three million dollars, three and a half million dollars to be exact. Yeah, he was the best pitcher available to them among the free agents, and they went for him. They were desperate for pitching this spring. Over at third base, we have Jose Lind, and at first base, Mike Lavalier. And the pinch hitter has a count now of two and one. Merced. He's an infielder and he's from Puerto Rico. He'll try to drive in the other Puerto Rican, Jose Lean. But now it's two and two, and Hurst could use the strikeout. First and third with one out. The home run by Bonds is tied it here in the six, four, four. Pittsburgh has out hit the Padres seven to five. And he wouldn't go for that low pitch three and two. Now they can afford to start Lavalier if they trust Merced to hit the ball, make contact. And there's Gene Lamont, the third base coach. Hurst has thrown Merced two split finger fastballs. I think you'll get another one. That's what he wants. The wiggle, split finger. Merced strikes out. A big strikeout for Hurst. And that's only his second of the game. So Jim Leland pulled the wrong trigger that time, and Merced goes down on strikes, two out. Well, Leland may have pulled the wrong trigger, but Mark Parent pulled the right trigger by giving the wiggle to Bruce Hurst. I think an experienced pitcher and catcher right there, you put a young hitter at a disadvantage by throwing him a non-conventional pitch. What's non-conventional? The split finger fastball. You can't pick it up real well. Young hitters in a situation like this, a little more anxious than an older hitter. Good call by Parent. Good pitch by Hurst. Gary Reedus takes a strike. Reedus has an RBI double and a walk. One for two. First and third. Two out. Watch the signs delivered by Parent. Fastball away to Reedus. And he missed with it, one and one. You hear the umpire, Fred Brocklander, say that's outside. If Reedus gets down to a two strike count, there's a possibility of a double steal. 4 4, bottom of the sixth. Fastball away. And he skies it away to Gwynn. So we played six innings and we're tied. One run, three hits, two left. Pittsburgh is left a half dozen. Ted Power was placed on the 15 day disable list with a strained right tricep. That's the muscle in back of the arm. He was 0 2 at the time, four saves. Funny about this Pirate bullpen seven different pitchers have saves in their bullpen. Seven. I mean, that gives you an idea of how they are, that uh, Jim Leland and the Pirate Pride has returned here to Pittsburgh. Their bullpen 
by committee. Seven different guys with saves in their bullpen. And as power, the right-hander takes over for the left-hander. Sean Abner is going to stay up there and lead off in the seventh inning of a 4-4 game. Abner has a single, is out stealing. He's one for two. We're into the seventh, and it's tough to beat these Pirates at home. Power came over here for a good chunk of money. Pitched for St. Louis last year. Try call it. And he lost some weight, and it increased his velocity. He can really bring the ball. And I'm talking about more than 90 miles an hour. Used to be with Cincinnati. Dodgers. And Abner's in the hole on two. It's the number six, seven, and eight hitters. The bullpen, as we mentioned earlier, only one earned run in the last 43 innings. That's why they're in first place. Red, strong, isn't it? Woo. Red Sox still on top on the Romine home run in the sixth inning. They'll fix that one up. One out. Well, Bob Walk had retired eight in a row, and Power picks up where he had left off. turns on it a nice convenient hop a little crow hop by Jay Bell that's that hop after the the fielder catches the ball and he's trying to grip the ball he takes a little something that's called a crow hop to get comfortable and to throw the ball straight to the first baseman well Mike Pagliarulo has the power to snap this tie we're 4 4 in the seventh inning Mike has three home runs he's 0 for 2 today that was against Walk. Watch how the feet allow Jay Bell to get the ball comfortably in his hand, to hold it across seams. Now watch when you catch it. A lot of times, it's not it's not ready to hold across seams. And by taking that little extra step, you make yourself comfortable there, right there. A little crow hop and a routine play. And that's what Tommy Sant, the coach, was talking about, Bell, trying to slow him down, get him to take it easy out there. He's a good shortstop these days. Three and all now to Pagliarillo. Power pumps one in there, three and one. You can really take your time on the artificial surface, too, because the ball gets to you quickly. Pagliarillo will be pumping on this one. White Sox jump ahead of the Yankees. One to nothing in the first, and that's ball four. One on, one out. Well, these Padres are stymied because of the absence of Benito Santiago. What a different club they are with him absent from behind the plate and at the plate. They have a young catcher purchased from the Cleveland organization. He played at Colorado Springs, Tom Lampkin. Tom's second tenure in the major leagues. He was only in four games with Cleveland last year. Tom batting 221 in 69 games with Colorado Springs. He's the only other Padre catcher. So they go with Parent. Powers steps off. Now Yurillo stolen only one base. One on, one out. Seventh inning. 4-4 the score here in Pittsburgh. White Sox leading the Yankees one to nothing. Oh boy. Offensive support of Andy Hawkins. The Yankees have not scored for him in at least 27 innings. He lost the no hitter the other night. The rain shortened no hit hitter to Melito Perez. Pinstripes need not apply. <laughs> I saw an ad once that said Doberman pincher for sale. Wear old clothes. <laughs> the score top of the seventh parent the batter and he shoots it into right center and Ben Slyke caught it runner will get back to first base just in time two out 
Van Slyke did not get a good jump on that ball, but he caught it two up. Andy, his second gold glove last year, even though he doesn't get a good jump on this ball, he makes up for it with good speed, and a strong throw to first is too late. And we're going to have a pinch hitter for San Diego with two outs, and that's all for Bruce Hurst. And Fred Lynn is swinging a bat. Hurst pitch, six innings. Gave four runs, seven hits, including the home run by Barry Bonds. He walked three. And one of the walks really hurt him, and he struck out two. So despite the fact they're two out, the new manager of the Padres, Greg Riddock, is going to take a shot with Fred Lynn. Greg Harris is going to come in out of the bullpen and take over the pitching for San Diego. Fred Lynn, one of the sweetest swings in the game for the last 15 years. The Rookie of the Year, most valuable player in 1975. Those are two titles in the same year that no other player has ever achieved. Low ball hitter. Ten power with two out. And you see Lynn chase a pitch like that very often. Now this is a tailing fastball. And of course you never would know Fred has a sweet swing by the looks of that with a rear end out and reaching but sometimes the pitchers will do that to you off the plate one and one power issued a walk with two out and pal Urillo is running the bases at first Freddie's only started eight games since June 1st good man to come off the bench mm -hmm. And that's ball two, two and one. Well, we wonder how sharp this pitcher is going to be. Ted Power just off the disabled list as of today. He walked in the manager's office this morning. He said, hey, Skip, what's what? So I'll be talking to you a little bit later on. Then he got the good news that he's on the roster at the expense of Walt Terrell. Blew it right by him, two and two. This fastball has a little more of the plate, and it's up. Fred Lynn, a, an excellent low ball hitter. He's not as quick as he used to be, but you throw that ball down and in, and he'll pepper it. Runner at first, two out in the top of the seventh, two and two to the batter. Three and two. Now the runner will go, and that helps such a runner as Al Urillo. Power nodded his head as the first baseman said, I'm playing behind the man. There's Gary Reedus. Good idea to stay on the line, too, with two outs. I think because Lynn can still pull the ball, and you stay on the line, prevent the double. Now Yerulo will go. He's on the move, and he struck him out. One left for San Diego. That's only the second man they've stranded. Everybody needs an Andy Van Slyke on their team. There aren't that many around, though. <laughs> Why is everybody always picking on me? Pitcher, Greg Harris, and a swing and a miss by Bell leading off. We're in the bottom of the seventh. We're tied 4 4. Andy Van Slyke will bat this inning. He's next. And it's low. We'd like to thank KDK producer Richard Sutman for the feature provided for CBS today with regard to Andy Van Slyke. 
funny feature about a funny guy. And a good ball player. Perhaps the best defensive outfielder in baseball these days. Nice to sit down around a cold one and talk about that subject, but his name has to come up. Bell falls in the hole one and two. He is 0 for 3. Pirates shortstop. Pittsburgh has out hit the Padres 7 to 5. The Pirates led 3 to nothing, trail 4 3 after 3. Tied it on the home run by Bonds in the sixth, and the count goes to two and two. Here we saw Ritas on the line in the top of the seventh inning with two outs and a runner at first. I'd play off the line with, with Jay Bell. I, I think the chances of him hitting a ball down the line remote, especially when Harris is throwing him a lot of breaking balls away. Three and two. Red Sox hanging on with a Romine home run. One nothing. And the White Sox increase their lead second inning two nothing over New York. And a fly ball to the center fielder Abner. One out here in the seventh. At the conclusion of this game Tim McCarver and I will select the Chevrolet most valuable player. Chevrolet will donate one thousand dollars in the player's behalf to the Special Olympics. Right. With one out. He's happy the left hander is out of there. Sometimes they bench him against certain left handed pitchers. New bat with one out in the seventh. Falls behind one and oh. There again, Phil Stevenson at first base playing the exception rather than the rule. I think with the Padre catchers and pitchers having problems throwing runners out, you keep guys off first. You don't protect against the double or the triple. I think you play the fat part of the infield against guys who can run. You see Stevenson on the line at first base. But if Van Slyke gets a single, the chances of him stealing second are pretty great, so you keep him off first. Then he hits it to the shortstop. Alomar playing there today. He eased that ball over. Alomar doesn't like shortstop. We mentioned earlier, we asked him if shortstop was in his future, and he shook his head very solemnly, said no. They surely have played hardball. Jim Leland and Greg Riddock both never had played in the major leagues. They didn't play one day of major league ball, and here they are opposing managers. Harris gets the breaking ball over to the thumper, Bobby Bonilla. Bonilla is one out of three. With two out, he chops it foul. Strike two. Here are other managers in the major leagues without major league experience along with Leland Tom Treblehorn Nick Leva John McNamara with Cleveland Stump Merrill with the New York Yankees and Greg Riddock six of the 26 have no major league experience on know and two a little flare into left and Thomas Howard caught up with that one so now we've played seven and we're still tied for a piece at four apiece going into the eighth inning and Sid Bream takes over at first base batting in the number one spot for the Pirates. San Diego started a lefty today Bruce Hurst and so Rita started there at first and now Bream is into the game and it's the top of the order represented by Bip Roberts. He's had a single and a walk he faces Ted Power. Took one down the middle. We're underway in the eighth. Couple of home runs, a three run job by Joe Carter and a game tying homer by Barry Bonds in the sixth. Through it by him. Power worked the seventh and a walk and a strikeout. He's just off the DL. I love the positioning of Barry Bonds in left field. He is daring Roberts to hit the ball over his head. The opposite fielder. One and two. Normally outfielders in a tie game in late innings, they would play a little bit deeper. But Bonds realizing 
as he's playing shallow. If Roberts gets on a guy who can run, it's a double, not a single. He's going to try to take the. Ooh, you can hear that one hit the leg, and it's a base hit. That thing went off the leg of Ted Power. And Roberts is on for the third time today. Bob Walk just off the DL, gets hit in the hand. Ted Power just off the DL, gets hit in the knee. The inside of the knee. Wow. Appears to be all right. Nobody's even asking. Hey, you talk about put together. You're right. He lost weight. He gained muscle weight. Got a body harder in high school trigonometry. This runner with Tony Gwynn up there has stolen 23 bases. So Power and LaVaier will have to watch him. Robert swiped one earlier today. And Power steps off. And LaVaier threw one out earlier today. You know, Thomas Howard is in there for Joe Carter batting fourth. I don't think Gwynn's going to be bunting right here. I think I'd opt for a hit and run in a situation like this. You don't want to waste Tony Gwynn's bat. Or he'll take a pitch or two and allow Roberts to try to steal it. Uh -huh. A left-hander, Bob Kipper, is throwing out in the right field corner for the Pirates. They've got three left-handers in their bullpen. Power in relief of Bob Walk. This is his game. Robert's not going, and Gwyn bunts, and the sacrifice is good, 1-3. Oh, they punted with Tony Gwynn. I'm a little surprised at that. I think what will happen now, they'll walk Alomar. No way to let Alomar hit with the go-ahead run potentially at second base and just pitch to Thomas Howard. I'm, I'm surprised that Gwynn was sacrificing that. Well, let's see if they do put him on or pitch to the switch hitter, Roberto Alomar. He drove in a run with two out in the third. That set the stage for the Carter home run. And he is one for three. They're going to work to him with a runner at second and one out. San Diego trying to regain the lead here in the eighth inning. Shortstop trying to get in behind Roberts. And ball one to Roberto. Greg Riddock in the middle there of the three. Partially blocked now. This might be one of those intentional, unintentional walks right here. Pitch around situation. I don't let Alomar beat me, not with Thomas Howard on deck. Runner at second base and one out. And that's low for ball two. They'd like it if Alomar chased a bad pitch. Now they're going to walk it, Tim. You were right. It took a while for that to be demonstrated, but. They put him on. It'll be the second walk given by Ted Power. And the third handed out to San Diego to go with six hits. So the rookie will come up. Well, the new batter is Thomas Howard, and he has not driven in a run in the big leagues. So what a perfect time for him for from the San Diego viewpoint to do that. Earlier we saw Joe Carter leave the game. He slammed into the fence. They say he has turf toe. Sometimes those injuries really linger. It's day to day as to when he's going to come back. Yeah, more an injury synonymous with football. That turf toe coming up all the time in the NFL. Now they're two on one out and Thomas Howard is a switch hitter and he could put the Padres on top. He's seven out of 21 this year. With the fastball. And usually when guys come off the bench they come off hacking and they look for the fastball and they swing at it. Pirates would like the double play ball. Two on, one out, four for the score. Padres batting in the eighth. Roberts, the runner at second. Inside to Howard, who's played in Spokane, Reno, Wichita, Las Vegas. On any ball hit to the outfield, I'm sure Sandy Alomar will be sending Bip Roberts. Good outfield arm 
Arms, we mentioned Bonds with nine assists in left field. Van Slyke both charged the ball very, very well. Thomas Howard trying to move the runners and power spins but doesn't throw. Single, a sacrifice, and a walk have set this up. And on its second, it's Bip Roberts and another good runner, Roberto Alomar, at first with one out. for ball two. Howard is looking for his first pinch hit as a big leaguer. 0 for two. Greg Riddock looking for his first major league win as a major league manager too. Howard at this moment of course is not pinch hitting. He took over for Joe Carter earlier in the outfield. Two on one out and a foul ball two and two. One out, two and two. I haven't seen much from Ted Power other than fastballs, Tim. Yeah, hard stuff. I think his name would denote that. Ted Power, what a great name. We talked about Bob Walk earlier. What a great name for a pitcher, Ted Power. He's not going to throw many ground balls. He's only had one ground ball double play thrown all year long. High ball, fastball pitcher primarily. Two and two to Thomas Howard. Four for the score in the eighth. Pittsburgh led three to nothing after two. Padres on top, four three after three. Then the home run by Bonds tied it in the sixth. They don't play Thomas Howard to pull the ball. Time call. It's a big pitch right here. You don't want to go to 3-2. Now you have the runners running. And they would certainly score on an, on an outfield base hit. Runners are not going. And a fly ball to center field for Van Slyke. Runner tags at second, but he won't try it. Two on, two up. And it'll be up to the left-handed batter Phil Stevenson he's 0 for 3 four home runs 13 runs batted in Jim Leland has Bob Kipper warming up but if you bring in Kipper you got Jack Clark to face now who would you rather have Phil Stevenson even though he's had three at bats facing power or Bob Kipper facing Jack Clark I think Jim Leland's making the right move right here that's Kipper number 16 and Clark by the way just well, he'd rather hit in this ballpark than any place else. Two on, two out. Stevenson could snap the tie. Runners are going, and then they go back, and there are two of them at second base. Oh, LaVayer does the right thing. He's got him hung up. And he is tagged out by Bell, and the inning is over. Roberts changed his mind. He really messed up the runner at first base. That's why that happened. And we're still tied going into the bottom of the eighth inning. There are some things in baseball that you can understand. This is one thing that you cannot understand. Two outs, Bip Roberts faking going to third and luring Roberto Alomar to second base. And watch Spanky. This is like a Spanky in our gang comedy right here. There's Spanky LaValue who made the right play running at the runner. And Bip Roberts is tagged out, and that was a terrible play by Bip Roberts. Under no circumstances can you lure the runner from first with two outs. None. There's strike one, and now one and one. There's Spanky LaValle in a picture of our game. <laughs> that looks like, yeah, it looked like him down around second base. <laughs> one ball, two strikes to Bonds, who hit the home run. He says that's in his locker. The guy on the right, he says, is R.J. Reynolds. <laughs> oh, that's great. Bonds leading it off. Case to pitch low from Greg Harris. And that's the first out in the eighth and the first strikeout for Greg Harris. And Greg Riddock said that he was, he told you before the game that he was going to work on fundamentals, and I'm sure he will have 
Bip Roberts in his office after the game to explain the do's and the don'ts of base running. And of course for Alomar once the lead runner goes he has to go. And Roberts changed his mind and here's a foul ball strike one. You could even understand a play like that with one out but with two outs you got to let the hitter drive you in. Especially Stevenson was up there with a left handed batter right handed right. pitcher. Where right. are you going. Where That's are you right. going. Harris tough on right handed hitters. Hey. And one ball one strike. Batters are only hitting 127 against Greg Harris. Outside. Outside said the umpire ball 2-2-1 two, two and one with one out. Bottom of the eighth, tied 4-4. Four, four. Batter Jeff King got a piece of it. King is 0 for 3. Hit the ball hard twice. The left fielder took care of both of those. Four four in the bottom of the eighth inning. Two and two. Three and two. Now if you challenge this guy, he, he can really hurt you. He has three home runs. And he doesn't play every day. at the mercy of the umpire but he walks and let's go to New York and Andrea Joyce for an update on the Yankee game. Jack it may be a little unusual but we've seen it twice today a wild pitch scoring a run this one from Tim Leary on a Sammy Sosa strikeout Ron Karkovai scores and Leary's out of the game Chicago leading New York seven nothing in the second back to Jack. Thank you Andrea. Leary has lost his last eight decisions. Now a runner at first. He's not fast, but at the plate. These days, I don't think there's anybody the Pirates would rather have in this spot than Jose Lee. That's exactly right and an excellent point, Jack. That's because King's at first base. Leland can do a lot of things here. He can send the runner and let Ling Lean swing away. Lean fouls the ball. Even that inside pitch. He's very stubborn and he's had two hits. Stolen base, run scored. Earlier in this game in the second inning, the pitcher struck out in a wild pitch. Brought home a pirate run and that preceded an RBI double by Reedus. So they had the same thing in the Yankee game. King drew a throw. He's over there with one out. You don't like to walk these batters in the tight game of this sort. Lean's going to hit the ball to the right side in all probability, yet Pally Rulo stays on third base guarding the line. No way you guard the line for me right here. Base hit is third of the day. And the runner challenges the center fielder and makes it. And Lean down to second and he makes it. These Pirates are doing a lot of things right. I think it's going to be a single for Jose Lean, his third hit of the day. And I believe he went to second on the throw to third. I think that's how it's going to be scored. High fastball and Jose Lean, the fat part of the field hitter. A strong throw by Abner, but offline. And because of that, Lean goes into second base. Good base running by Jose Lean. Watch him make his decision once he sees the throw awry and go into second base. Now Abner should have known or well, he knows his own capabilities whether or not he should have thrown the third he made a terrible throw so therefore he should have thrown into second to keep the double play in order. That Here's way you do that. That's exactly right to keep the double play in order with one out and now Leland can do still other things with Backman. You can squeeze he is an excellent bunner. And he also is going to hit the ball the other way unless he gets a curveball. And you'll see the Padre outfield, I would imagine, Abner right now going into left center, Thomas Howard very inexperienced in left. Back 
Chapman has two home runs, 20 RBIs. They're going to walk him. This will be the second walk given by Greg Harris and the fifth given to the Pirates. So he'll make Leland go to the bench for another batter, and he has some good ones on there yet. I'm guessing R.J. Reynolds will come out of the dugout. You know, I'm wondering why Backman is pinch hitting for Lavalier. I've got to believe that I've got to believe that Lavalier is hurt, and he may have hurt himself on that play around second base. We saw him limping coming off the field. Otherwise, why would Backman be pinch hitting for a left hand and wasted like this because they figured to walk it right. We were just told and handed a note that LaValier was injured indeed in that rundown play around second base and that's why Backman was pinch hitting for LaValier. Now the bases are loaded with one out. This is what the throw by Abner created. With Lean taking the extra base, then they had to walk Backman. And let's see, it's probably going to be R.J. Reynolds. Meanwhile, the new Padre manager goes to the mound. There's nobody in the bullpen. So they're going to talk about how they'll pitch to R.J. Reynolds. There's Greg Litta. How they'll pitch and how they'll play the infield. I would imagine that a trip like this is as important to the infielders as it is to the pitcher. Riddock talking to Mark Parent. If Pittsburgh grabs the lead here and they have the base that loaded one out in the eighth of a 4 4 game we'll see number 43 Bill Landrum into the game otherwise we'll see Kipper powers out of the game he could be the winner and this Pittsburgh club just seems to get done what they have to do and we'll mention again they're so difficult to beat at home the infield comes in for San Diego Reynolds is the batter he's a switch hitter Driven in 13 runs. Ball one from Greg Harris. You know it started this, don't you? A one-out walk to Jeff King. He's batting 235. Base it loaded one out. And a late swing and a foul. One and one. with one out. Lean got a base hit. He's at second. He took second on the throw. Then they walked back. And Reynolds is up. And he is a perfect guy to have on your ball club. His temperament is just ideal as a pinch hitter and a part-time player. Infield in. And he gets it through. Two runs. The throw by Gwynn. It is too late. Pittsburgh takes a 6-4 lead. Tony Gwynn was late and up the line diving for it was Bip Roberts but lean scores easily and the Pirates grab a two two run lead well you're right about that Reynolds I'll tell you he is some ball player and some guy to have around now his sixth hit and RBI's number five and six as a pinch hitter here comes Greg Riddock and he wants a new hurler Pittsburgh has taken the lead for the second time today, 6-4. This relief break is sponsored by Rollays. Our new pitcher is Rich Rodriguez. He, uh, Rodriguez. He used to be part of the New York Mets organization. And he comes on. No wins or losses or saves. The third pitcher of the day. 
for San Diego. Who are the top relievers in baseball these days? They count the wins, the saves, subtract the blown save opportunities. Eckersley is really hot out of the bullpen with thick pen of the White Sox behind him and John Franco and Lufferts of San Diego tied for the lead in the National League. There's Jose Lean. He's always in the middle of everything these days for Pittsburgh. He has three hits today. It's first and third one out. Watch the squeeze play. And a fly ball foul by Bream who is batting for the first time. Greg Harris gave up these runs. He is upset. I'll tell you what you have to do though to put this in perspective is remember the top of the inning when the Padres messed up with men at first and second and one out and lost the runner to end the inning. Bip Roberts stopping halfway to third and luring Alomar to go to second base and Mike Lavalier pulling the rundown play perfectly as he ran at the runner Bip Roberts and Roberts was eventually tagged out. Yeah, that was a terrible play on Robert's part. There were two out at the time. Here's Sid Bream. And he took it low. Bream is batting 270. Didn't start today. They put him in for defensive purposes here in the later innings. And he bats for the first time. Now, he's not a real good runner, so the Padres could get out of it with a double play. And there's a chance of a squeeze play. Maybe. But Bream wants at least the fly ball. And a throw to first by Rodriguez. That ball that Reynolds hit was a curve ball. I'm telling you, it looked like he hit it with a shovel. That thing was about four inches off the ground. Reynolds got it done. And he got it past the drawn in infield. There goes Reynolds. They pitch out and throw too late. So there goes the double play. There again, we have the Padres without Santiago. Unable to throw people out. And catchers are trained with runners at first and third to look the runner back at third and then throw to second. And looking the runner back on that pitch out cost Mark Parent the quick release to get Reynolds. Now the infield in again. They're in tight. A base hit would mean a couple of more. Backman at third. Reynolds at second. One out. Breaking ball. Well. On a pitch out, I don't think you look the runner back at third base, but watch Parent right there. Look at the runner at third base, and now that little delay, and the throw is fine, but Reynolds is in there. Three and one to Bream. A base open and a right-handed batter next. And a base hit. They bring him around, and the throw to the plate is not made. It's eight to four. Padres are not playing very well here today. This ball is scorched by Sid Bream, a low liner. I tell you, that ball was by Roberts before he jumped. Before that's he how got hard. Off the ground. Yeah, that's how hard that ball was hit. It was hit hard. Maybe he didn't see it, but in any event, it whistled by him. And now here is Jay Bell. And they hold against Bream at first. It's been a four run eighth for these Pirates. I tell you, whatever they need, they seem to get. That's where they're riding in first place. And that skull and crossbones is so high on that flagpole. A strike call to Bell, who is 0 for 4. Pittsburgh started the day two in front of the Mets who play tonight. Take no prisoners. Two. Make them walk the plank. count strike two. What is a Buccaneer? Well that's a high price to pay for corn. And Pittsburgh's leading eight to four here in the eighth inning. They've out hit the Padres ten to six. Runner in first and still only one out. A walk started all of this. One and two. Sox have broken an open against the Yankees early. 7 0 second inning. Bream the runner. He made the most of his only at bat here today. And he's being held by Stevenson. 
outside. Earlier in this inning, the top of the inning, Stevenson, the San Diego first baseman, never got a chance to bat with two on, two out as they lost that runner. Just missed, and that's three and two. gave up the two hits and a walk plus the intentional walk. Now Breen will likely go. Running with one out and a fly ball into right field for Gwynn. Throws back into first and Breen returns in time. Two out. Well we've had some action in this one. It's 8-4 Pirates. And Pittsburgh got out in front but the home run by Joe Carter made that lead disappear. Then Barry Bonds hit a home run and that tied it. And R.J. Reynolds with the score tied. Single pass the drawn in infield 6-4. Then Sid Bream made it 8-4. Bream's at first two out. And the batter is Andy Van Slyke. And he's 0 for 4. Bream will play it cool at first base. To see what Van Slyke can do. First two out. Fly ball high in the air for the center fielder and the right fielder. Who wants it? Gwynn takes it. The inning is over. Four runs for Pittsburgh on only three hits. They leave one. They've left seven. We've played eight. And the Pirates have the lead. They bring in Bill Landrup. Eight to four. A rip roaring gunslinging adventure with an all star cast when Kenny Rogers returns in the Gambler 3 Sunday. I guess the headline in the Pittsburgh Press Gazette tomorrow, the Bulldog Edition tonight, huh? R.J. Reynolds' rap ruins Riddock. Well, it has so far, but the Padres still with the last gasp effort here in the ninth. They'll have to do it against a tough reliever. Bill Landrum comes on to be the third pitcher of the day and these fans love it. The Pirates are about 140,000 ahead of their attendance of a year ago. Here's Phil Stevenson who had the bat taken out of his hands in the eighth inning when Bip Roberts made the blunder. There's Greg Riddock. He's still looking for his first win. He has the lineup card in his hand. Phil Stevenson will lead it off here in the ninth, and it's 8 4 Pittsburgh. They have out hit the Padres 10 to 6. Landrum used to belong to Cincinnati, and he has matured about right on schedule. It's too bad all clubs can't hang on to these pitchers and give them a fair opportunity to grow and learn. There's a strike. One well, that, one. That's an interesting point, Jack, because uh, unknowingly what a lot of organizations do, they prepare pitchers for other organizations. That's the way it turns out. Stevenson's in the hole. He's 0 for 3 today. There's just no way to know sometimes. Some guys are late maturing, as in Landrum's case, really rescued the Pirate Relief Corps last year when Jim Gott got hurt. Stevenson stays up there with a one two count and a new catcher is Dan Billardello I guess when Don Slot comes back and perhaps tomorrow Billardello shuffles off to Buffalo one and two to the leadoff hitter so they're making changes and the Pirates in first place are getting better they've got John Smiley back he struck out you chased it sir one out. This copyrighted telecast presented by authority of Major League Baseball may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. And here's Sean Abner. He has a single, but he was thrown out stealing by Lavalier earlier in the game. Tough to run against these Pirates. Tough to do a lot of things against them. Ball one. 
Andrea Joyce will be coming along after a while. Meanwhile, the Royals have topped the Red Sox for the moment, two to one, and the Yankees are on the board, but trailing seven two. There is one out in the bottom of the ninth, and that's ball two. There's the pirate parrot. Can't fly. Can barely dance. One out here in the ninth. Ball three. And the last thing Landrum wants to do is walk Abner. Padres trail by four. And ball four. Puts Abner on base for the second time. It's the fourth walk given to the Padres. Tell you the big play in this ball game with Runners at first and second and two out in the eighth inning. This is how it ended. Bip Roberts broke for third, luring Alomar to second. Mike Lavalier, who eventually gets hurt on this play, properly runs at Roberts. He makes him commit, and eventually Jay Bell makes the tag. You don't know what Stevenson would have done, but that was a poor play on Bip Roberts' part. There were two on, two out in the top of the eighth, and the score was tied at that time. Now Mike Pagliarulo, 0 for 2 with a walk. There's a strike, and Landrum is back in the strike zone. The Pirates would like the double play to end it. Padres would like Pagliarulo to get on base. Pittsburgh, 10 hits. The Padres, 6. Strike 2. Coming up next. That Reebok Greg Norman golf challenge that's coming up next year on CBS with Greg Norman taking on Gretzky Bird and Lundell what a trio they play a scramble and Greg Norman will play it straight the players are Mike you'll have some fun if you stay where you are with CBS out of play by Pagliarulo on two and then part two will be tomorrow they'll play the front nine today it's been taped and you'll see it today and then again manana. Sid Bream playing behind the runner at first base because the Padres can't afford to do any running as they trail by four, eight, four, ninth inning. Pagliarulo in the hole. 0 oh and 2. Got it. That's the second out, both on strikeouts. And the Chevrolet player of the game is Jose Lean, Chico. Jose of the Pirates and Chevrolet will donate $1,000 in his behalf to the Special Olympics. He had three base hits today, scored two runs. And he was in the middle of two of their three scoring innings. This is Mark Parent. He's 0 for 3 on the last hope for the Padres. And if Parent doesn't do anything, the new manager, former coach of the Padres, Greg Riddock, will be 0-3 when he comes here after church tomorrow. And the Pirates will go 20 games above 500 for the first time since 1979. That's something. Runner at first, two out. Strike called. One one. If you folks don't follow the Pirates closely and just look at the standing and expect somebody else to win it, don't discount this man and his team. I tell you, they're solid. Now they get slot back. They got power back today. They got John Smiley back. They're going to be better than they were. Runner at first, two out. They got Bob Walk back. He started today and did rather well. Out of play. One and two. Eight to four. The Pirates lead the Padres. Andrea Joyce is standing by. We'll hear from her. In our studio in New York. The fans wanted to end right here. They're on their feet. Parent, two out. Breaking ball. Who says the crowd? Two and two. They'll stay a little longer. 29,533 paid here today. Runner at first, two out. Top of the ninth. Eight four Pittsburgh. Two and two on the batter. That's it. San Diego leaves four in the game. The winner 
Here's Ted Power and the loser, Greg Harris, and Pittsburgh has won the first two games of the series. I'll tell you, Jack, that Pirate Pride banner is very appropriate because I think the pride is back here in Pittsburgh. Four Super Bowls by the Steelers in the 70s, six division championships. Pittsburgh, the only team in the National League East without a division championship in the 80s. I'll tell you, these guys have a shot, a good shot. 8, 10, and 0, 7 left Pittsburgh, 4, 6, and 1, San Diego, 4 left. The winner, Ted Power, is first of the year, 1 and 2. And Greg Harris, the loser, 4 and 4. There is no save. Andrea Joyce will be coming along on the heels of our commercial. Pittsburgh, 1 at 8, 4. It's Andrea Joyce back in New York. Coming up next, stay tuned for the Greg Norman Challenge. Superstars Wayne Gretzky, Yvonne Lendl, and Larry Bird team up to challenge pro golfer Greg Norman in a scramble format. Now let's quickly bring you up to date on a couple of scores at Fenway Park. Kansas City scored twice in the eighth. The Royals lead Boston by one. And at Yankee Stadium, it is the White Sox over the Yankees 7-3, that game in the fourth inning. And we'll be back with more in just a moment. Under that next Saturday, Major League Baseball continues on CBS Sports. Some of you will see the San Francisco Giants against the Chicago Cubs at Wrigley Field. Others will see the Phillies against the Reds from Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati. And once again, stay tuned now for the Greg Norman Challenge. For Jack Buck and Tim McCarver, I'm Andrea Joyce in New York. Have a pleasant Saturday night. CBS Sports presents Major League Baseball. Today's game has been brought to you by Mr. Goodwrench Parks. The goods under your hood at General Motors dealers. Head and shoulders because you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And by the companies of the Prudential, come to the Prudential and build your future on the rock. Once again, the final score from Pittsburgh, the Pirates over the Padres, 8-4. You've been watching Major League Baseball on CBS Sports, the home of baseball's jeweled events.